It's really a pleasure and an honor to be here. Um, I have had various interaction with various people at the faculty at the University of Washington, and really it's an honor to be here and talk to you about uh, some of the things that we do now at Signature Genomic Laboratories. What I would like to do is uh, frame what we do within the context of the evolution of clinical cytogenetics and try to stress that this technology really is only a development of the uh, great advances that happened over the last 50 years or so in cytogenetics, but also stress that at the same time, while it is only an evolution, it is a transformative and disruptive technology that has affected the way we look at chromosomes now, or the way we don't look at them anymore. Uh, and in a way, it has been disruptive for the field and has changed both clinical cytogenetics and clinical medicine in the area of uh, medical genetics. So uh, with that, I have to, now that I moved away from my academic credentials and that I am uh, a part owner and I sit on the board and I uh, uh, own part of a company, I have to tell you that uh, I do all of these things. Okay, with that out of the way, uh, let me define the field where we spent uh, most of our lives, and this is looking at chromosomes and trying to figure out if there are pieces of chromosomes that are missing or extra. And the reason we do that is because chromosomal abnormalities are common. Uh, if you study, let's say, uh, coronary artery disease, you may not think about chromosomal abnormalities as being common, but in the world of genetics, they are the number one cause of genetic problems in children and young adults. So about 1% of babies are going to have a chromosomal abnormality. 2% of pregnancies in women that are over 35 years of age are going to have some sort of a chromosomal abnormality. 50% of spontaneous abortions in the first trimester are also chromosomal in origin. And of course, uh, all cancers are going to acquire during the life of the cancer or the patient some sort of a structural chromosomal abnormality in addition to point mutations and expression problems and methylation problems. So the indications for a chromosomal study includes all of the laundry list I, I read to you earlier, which are problems in a child in early growth and development, whether it is physical or uh, uh, neuropsychological, uh, stillbirth and neonatal death, fertility problems in a couple, uh, family history of any of those uh, other problems, uh, pregnancy in a woman of advanced maternal age, and of course in cancer. Now these chromosomal abnormalities come in many different flavors. They can be problems with the number of chromosomes where you have extra chromosomes or missing chromosomes. These are called aneuploidy. Or you can have an extra set of chromosomes. So you have an extra set of a whole number of chromosomes. And these are called polyploidy. Or you can have mosaicism where the individual has more than one cell line. Uh, one being, for example, normal and one having an abnormality of a number of chromosomes. So these are numerical abnormalities, or they can be structural, where you can have pieces of chromosomes that are missing, such as what you will see in deletions, or you could have translocations, where you have pieces of chromosomes that have moved around from one to another, or inversions or other rearrangements. The uh, history of cytogenetics can be summarized as follows, and I took this from Dr. Thurman's book. That is the dark ages, and these are before 1952, where we were negotiating the number of chromosomes that we had. Some people said it was 46, others said 48, and nobody really knew uh, what humans have in terms of number of chromosomes. It was not until Dr. T.C. Shu in Houston uh, made an observation uh, that uh, uh, allowed uh, the number of chromosomes to be determined to be 46, and uh, that was built on an error in the laboratory where the cells were suspended in a hypotonic solution that allowed the nuclei to swell, and thus allowing the chromosomes, when they landed on a microscope slide, to separate more easily and be able to count 46 versus 48. That observation ushered the following period, which is the trisomy period, where Lejeune in France discovered that Down syndrome is due to three three copies of chromosome 21 instead of two copies. And then shortly thereafter, Peto and Edward uh, described trisomy 13 and 18. After that, in, 19, in the early 70s, Dr. Kaspersen in Sweden uh, developed a method to ban the chromosomes. And these are the chromosomes that now we look at usually. Although he used quinacrine mustard, now we use G-banded chromosome in most labs in the US, although Europeans still like to look at Q-banded chromosomes. 
Um, this was technology that was developed in the 70s. And since then, there was more than a decade and a half before things really changed in cytogenetics. And even till today, in the area of clinical cytogenetics, uh, we still look at chromosomes with G-banded technology, which was developed in the 70s. And when you think about it, there are very few things that we use now in terms of technology that were developed in the 70s. You know, nobody has eight tracks in their cars anymore. So, uh, I don't know if Kent, you have one, but... Uh, <laughs> So, and then there is the molecular era that was ushered in the late 80s with the work of Dan Pinkel and Joe Gray when they developed fish or fluorescence and cytohybridization. And then through a lot of very important uh, discoveries and innovation, they built on this initial uh, um, uh, invention of fish to develop other applications of fish uh, that culminated with CGH, competitive genome hybridization, and the last iteration of that, which is array CGH, that I will be talking to you about. So what's the problem? What was wrong with these chromosomes that were banding? Nothing is wrong other than your resolution is really not good. And what do I mean by resolution? When you look at chromosomes under the microscope, you can tell if there are big pieces of DNA that are missing or extra or that have been shifted around. And by big pieces, I mean they have to be five million bases or more in order for you to consistently be able to make a call. Now, if you're really good and if you happen to have a good day in Seattle where the humidity is right, then you have long chromosomes, then you may be able to call a few abnormalities that are in the range of two megabases, two million bases, two five million bases. But consistently, no cytogeneticist will tell you that I can for sure identify abnormalities all the time that are two megabases or less. So the resolution is not good because if you think about it, two, mil two million bases can contain in them about uh, 15 to 30 genes that you may not be seeing. So these are big abnormalities. So because of that, FISH was developed. FISH stands for fluorescence and cytohybridization. And there are many uh, applications for FISH. You can do a locus-specific FISH, and I'll just show you an example of that, whereby you take a specific probe for a specific locus, a single area on, in the genome, that you could do hybridization and identify whether that probe is going to hybridize to the appropriate area of the genome, yes or no. Then you can paint the whole chromosomes, or you could do comparative genome hybridization, and I will go into the details of those. So here is FISH. The technology is fairly simple. You obtain a piece of DNA uh, that is usually, on average, about uh, anywhere from 80 to 250,000 bases base pair long. You uh, label it. You denature it. You allow it to hybridize onto a representation of the human genome, which usually is a metaphase spread or a nucleus, such as you see here metaphase spread or a nucleus, and you allow the DNA to renature and hybridize onto its target sequence. The problem, and, and what, I, what you're seeing here is an example of uh, uh, painting of chromosomes. The problem with these technologies is that for single locus fish, you need to know what is the target that you're looking at. You need to have a clinician telling you, I suspect that this child has the George VCF, which is usually associated with a deletion of the long arm of chromosome 22. Therefore, you in the lab will pick up a probe that you know goes to that area, maps to that area, you label it and you hybridize it. If the clinician's suspicion is wrong, your result is going to be normal, but it doesn't mean that the patient does not have a deletion elsewhere. So these technologies are either low resolution, such as G-banded chromosome, or they may be at high resolution with fish, but you need to have a knowledge of the area you're looking at. And either way, it's a lot of work. You need, to ha you need to grow the cells in culture, and you need to have a fairly sophisticated way to look at these chromosomes, and training is, 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 is very lengthy for the technologist. And this is another example that shows you a deletion on the short arm of chromosome 1. Uh, but looking at it on G-banded chromosome, these look normal uh, because the deletion is very small, but you could see it with fish because you have this is a normal chromosome 1, and this chromosome 1 is missing the red signal here. So DNA microarrays were developed 
to circumvent the limitation of regular fish and traditional cytogenetics. When I talk about uh, microarrays, I mean a solid platform on which you can immobilize uh, nucleic acid. Now you can immobilize other things on a piece of, of, of uh, glass slide or silica, but I'm talking specifically now about DNA microarrays and the applications of those, and I will be talking specifically about CGH. There are many applications for DNA microarrays. You could do expression profiling, you could do genotyping, you could do DNA resequencing, or you could do comparative genome hybridization, which is what I will be talking about. So in a nutshell, you have a microscope slide on which you uh, immobilize pieces of DNA, and this is a representation of the human genome, where you have pieces of DNA that you literally print onto the microscope slide. And these could be backs, or could be packs, or could be oligonucleotide. The backs and the packs, each piece, each, piece of, each piece of DNA you have here is again about 80,000 base pair to 250,000 base pair. Oligos are much smaller, they could be 25 bases long, to 60 bases long. So we're talking hundreds of thousands compared to few hundred, uh, uh, less than 100. So these are arrayed on a microscope slide. And as I said, they could be printed. And in some cases, that could be synthesized onto the slide itself. I'm not going to go into the details of that. I'm going to concentrate on the applications of that. So uh, traditional CGH, or comparative genome hybridization, does exactly what it says it does. It compares two genomes. And the idea is the following. You have a patient that, on whom you suspect that there is a deletion or a duplication of DNA. So you ask a question, does this patient have a normal complement of DNA compared to a normal control? So you obtain DNA from an individual whom you suspect should be normal chromosomally because they are phenotypically normal, presumably. And then you obtain DNA from the patient. You label each one of those tubes in a different fluorophore. You mix them together and you allow them to compete and hybridize onto a representation of a normal human genome. In this case, in traditional CGH, it is a metaphase spread of a normal individual. For all of those areas of the genome where the patient and the control are both normals, they are going to compete equally onto the target and hybridize green and red at equal levels. And you can look at these chromosomes either through a microscope or you can allow the software uh, uh, laser beam that will go and excite the dye onto the microscope slide, capture the image of the green dye and the red dye, and then record it as a digital output in terms of intensity of each one of those dyes. And then you could either have a plot or you can visually also say that there is a piece here on the long arm of chromosome 8, this is chromosome 8, where the control, who is green, has more copies DNA compared to the patient who is red. Therefore, this looks more green than, than, than yellow. Okay? Now, the problem with this technology here is that the resolution is still limited by the size of the chromosomes. When you take now the human genome, and if you think about this chromosome like a salami, and you can slice it into very thin pieces and line them side by side, then you are able to look at a much higher resolution of this chromosome than you are able to do when it is laying like this onto a metaphase spread. So now you can determine your resolution at a much higher level depending on the size of each one of those uh, pieces of DNA you put on the microscope slide. And now you don't look at it if you notice there is no microscope anymore. It's all scanned and then you are recording everything digitally. Okay? So, why is this important? Well, this is important because now you can identify any copy number of DNA imbalance in a patient compared to a control. So these could be microscopic, meaning you can see them on a microscope, such as trisomy 21. They could be unbalanced translocation. They could be marker chromosomes. Marker chromosomes are small pieces of uh, abnormal chromosomes that usually contain a nucleus, and you can't tell what they are. You call them marker chromosomes because they are so small and tiny, you don't know what is the origin of this particular piece of chromosome. But now you can identify it with an ACGH. Also, anything that's submicroscopic, which means you won't see it even with the best set of eyes and the best microscopes, these are the microdeletion, microduplication areas and unbalanced translocations, deletions or duplications of the telomeres, which are the tips of the chromosomes, like I showed you with chromosome 1 earlier. The only thing that's important to remember is that uh, 
this technology will not uncover anything that is balanced. So if you have only shuffling of DNA around, you're not going to detect it with an ACGH. So let's talk about some diagnostic applications. I'm going to give you some examples now with this technology and show you its evolution from the early days where we had arrays that were fairly limited in that they didn't have a whole representation of the genome to a much denser arrays now that are based on oligonucleotide where you could pretty much put a very dense representation of the human genome where now you are generating a lot of data but then the question and the challenge becomes how you interpret this amount, this huge amount of data and I I will touch upon that towards the end of my talk. But um, let me just explain a few things for you here so that you will be able to become as good as cytogeneticists as we move forward in interpreting these abnormalities. This is a normal chromosome 21 in the top panel. Uh, you can see two, over, uh, two lines that are overlaying each other. One is pink, the other one is blue. And the reason is we perform every experiment twice. The array CGH experiment I told you about, where you label the patient in one color and the control in another. You do your hybridization, you do your scanning, and then you plot a line. And then you reverse, you take another fresh slide, you do another experiment where now you swap the colors. Now you have the patient that is now in green, the control in red. You repeat the experiment onto another slide, and then you plot both of these results onto the same slide. And this, in a diagnostic setting, allows you. Do you need to do it? The answer is no, you don't need to do it. But since we are in the business of looking at rare things, occasionally it is very helpful, especially in mosaic cases, to be able to see both experiments uh, uh, agreeing with one another whenever there is an abnormality. So this is an example of the two experiments plotted here for chromosome 21. And this is a child who has trisomy 21, that is an extra copy of chromosome 21 compared to a control. And as a convention now, from now on for the rest of the hour, whenever you see pink over blue, this is DNA copy gain for the patient compared to the control. If you see blue over pink, it is DNA copy loss for the patient instead of the control. Think about it that the patient is blue because they lost something and they are tickled pink when they gain something. Okay? So now we're ready to do cytogenetics. Uh, this is normal chromosome 9. And here, this is a mosaic trisomy 9. And the reason I say mosaic is because the separation here is not as what you usually see. And we confirmed that by fish. When we looked at metaphase cells and we fished for pro with probes that are specific for chromosome 9, only 3% of the cells showed that there was trisomy 9. But then when we looked at interface cells, it was really 10%. And when you take a blood smear, it's 21%. What that means is that if a person is mosaic, meaning they have two different cell lines, and you culture the cells, you may be selecting against the abnormal cell line. So if you're doing traditional cytogenetics, in some cases, you may be selecting against the abnormal cell line. By the time you finish your culture and you look at it under the microscope, scope, it may look completely normal. You may miss a 3% mosaicism. And it's not because you did not do a good job. It's simply because the biology of growing cells outside in a culture medium is not going to be conducive for an abnormal cell line to survive. But again, this is not a hard law because we have seen the opposite also, where sometimes you grow cells and you have the abnormality that may confer an advantage to the abnormal cell line. So it's not, it's not a law, but we've seen a lot of mosaicism with RACGH. So I showed you numerical abnormalities, mosaic numerical abnormalities. Let me show you now the telomeres and the subtelomeres. This is a normal chromosome 10. As you can see now, the density of the arrays are getting denser. We're seeing many more spots uh, per chromosome. Think about this chromosome as laying on its side. This is the tip of the short arm of chromosome 10. This is the tip of the long arm of chromosome 10. It's laying on its side. And this is a normal chromosome 10. This is a chromosome 10 that's clearly missing a piece here. This one is missing a big piece here. And this one is missing a piece that goes all the way to the end. Now notice that at the end here you have normal patterns. These are two chromosomes that you would have missed completely if you were doing telomere fish. For a long time, for about 8 to 10 years, telomere fish was the best thing we had to look at the tips of the chromosomes and be able to see if there are missing pieces of chromosomes or not at the tip. And now we realize that a lot of these abnormalities may be subtelomeric. So if you have a probe that goes to the very close area in the subtelomeric region here, you may have a completely normal result by telomeric 
telomere fish, but indeed the deletion is more proximal. And this is a cartoon that shows you how this may be. If this is a terminal deletion in a chromosome, and this is an interstitial subtelomeric deletion, if you did fish, you're going to have hybridization here and you will miss that abnormality by telomere fish, you will detect it here. But with RACGH, you're not going to miss it. Then, there is this whole family of conditions that were known as the microdeletion, microduplication syndromes. These are conditions that are clinically recognizable, where you see a patient across the room, and if you're a clinical geneticist, you could say this patient has Williams syndrome, for example, or the George VCF. And these have a common deletion of an area, for example, on chromosome 7. But in the days of fish, when you did a single probe, you would take a single probe to the area and confirm your diagnosis. But we realize now that there are a lot of individuals with Williams syndrome who have an atypical deletion, meaning they are missing bigger pieces of chromosomes, and these may be associated with more severe phenotypes. You are also able to identify not only deletions, but also the reciprocal product of the deletions, which are a duplication. As you remember, deletion is blue over pink, duplication is pink over blue. So now we realize that the George VCF, which is due to a deletion, also has a lot of a counterpart. If you think in the bizarro world of deletion, this is a duplication. So there are a lot of individuals who have a duplication of the same area that is commonly deleted. And there is a long story behind that. It has to do with the mechanism, how these deletions happen, but I'm not going to go into that. Suffice it to say that now we understand the duplication better and the phenotype that's associated with the duplication is becoming now much more complex than we thought, meaning that some patients can be completely normal with the duplication, others may have a problem, and uh, this is now a ground for a lot of research that's happening. It's also, you can identify unbalanced translocation. This is uh, chromosome 4 and chromosome 8 in a patient, and you can see you have loss of the tip of chromosome 4, and you have a gain of the tip of chromosome 8. By looking at the microarray itself, you cannot tell how this really happened onto the patient's chromosome unless you do fish, and by doing fish here, you realize that you have an abnormality where this chromosome a4 here is normal, but this one has, is missing uh, a piece uh, from the top of chromosome uh, 4. Actually, excuse me, I'm, I'm, uh, yes, that's correct. And you have normal chromosome 8, and the piece from chromosome 8 has been added to the top of chromosome 4. All right. So that is a kind of a, a little segue going into the importance of fish. We always discuss, now that you have this very powerful technology called RACGH, do you really need to do fish to look at these chromosomes? And the answer is, whenever you have deletions, really you may not need to do fish because fish will tell you it's deleted. And we believe the data from microarray now much better than fish. But it's important in areas when you have a DNA copy gain to try to understand whether this gain is due to a duplication, is due to an insertion, is due to an unbalanced translocation, or is due to some other mechanism. And here are some examples to show you that. This is normal chromosome 18. Here is in the area of the pericentromeric region, so around the centromere of chromosome 18, we have DNA copy gain. When you fish it, you realize that you have two normal chromosome 18, but also in 68% of the cells, there is this big signal here, which is a marker chromosome 18, okay? So you need, it, were it not for fish, you would not be able to understand why you have DNA copy number here. I'm showing you now here two identical abnormalities, which are gains in the short arm, in the pericentromeric area, in the short arm of chromosome 17. And the they look identical by array, but the mechanism of how this happened is very different, and the implications for the clinical cytogeneticist who will be doing counseling are different, and you ought to be conveying this information. This here is an example where you have a normal 17. Here, this seems like a duplication. You have a signal that's stronger here than here, and when you look at interface nuclei, you can see that you have two signals on that chromosome 17. Whereas in that panel, for that particular case, you have two normal 17, and then you have another extra signal here that is a derivative or a marker chromosome 17, okay? 
Here is another case where, again, the two arrays look the same, and I will stop after that. These two, chromosome 7, this is the telomeric area. You have DNA copy gain. You don't know what the mechanism is. But then when you look at it, case 1 seems to be due to an unbalanced translocation. These are the two normal chromosome 7. But then there is a piece of chromosome 7 that is on 14, whereas here you have a duplication of 7. Okay, different mechanisms. Okay. So I'm going to go quickly over that one and just finalize this part saying that fish visualization is important because it identifies the underlying cytogenetic mechanism, it determines the level of mosaicism, it provides information about recurrence risks, and it guides you now for parental analysis whether you need to do fish on the parents or whether you need to go ahead and just do microarray. So let's talk a little bit about the evolution of these DNA arrays. As you saw maybe earlier, I started with these arrays that had very few spots along the chromosome. And now we started adding more spots as we know more about the human genome. And more recently, the oligoarrays were developed. Oligoarrays refers, as I said earlier, to oligonucleotide arrays, whereby now your substrate, instead of being big pieces of uh, DNA, are tiny little 60 mers or so. So this is a cartoon that shows you the difference between back arrays and oligo arrays. Although this is a just a particular uh, design of the arrays, uh, the way we use them in the clinic. Uh, this is a cartoon that shows you chromosome seven, and we're now focusing onto a small part of chromosome seven. We blow it up here, and as you can see, these little orange bars, each one of them refers to a particular oligonucleotide that maps into that area. This here is the coverage of that area with the bacterial artificial chromosomes or the backs. And as you can see, I'm trying to show you here that a bag a back is big and the oligo is tiny. The advantage now of the oligo arrays is that you can have a backbone of all of these tiny little oligos that are all over across the genome. So whereas a back array that we use in the clinic may have on it 5,000 spots, an oligo array can have 105,000 spots or more. You could have 200, you could have millions if you want. So you can get a lot more information from an oligo array compared to a back array. Other than that, the technology is pretty much identical. Once you can uh, generate the uh, uh, data file on which you want these oligos to be printed, then you could print it the same way you would print a back, you could print an oligo. The difference is here you have a few thousand spots, here you could have hundreds of thousands of spots. Then you do your CGH the same way, you scan it the same way, and then the analysis here, you use much more software to help you with the oligo data than with the, with the back data. Now, the advantage of the oligo arrays is that, as I told you, you don't have gaps in the design of these arrays as you do them. So that this is an example where we have an individual in whom we found a deletion, where we have three overlapping back clones that show a deletion, and we could confirm it by fish, but on either side we have gaps. And by gaps we mean we don't have coverage of the genome uh, on either side of this abnormality. On what, this side it's about 10 million base long, and on this side it's 7 million base long, and the question is how large is this deletion? Well, we went ahead and we took that particular DNA from that patient and we ran it onto a commercially available microarray that has on it 244,000 oligonucleotides. And the array results showed us a lot of abnormalities. So here is the, this illustrate the, what I was telling you earlier about this idea of when you have a very dense array that is based on oligonucleotide, you're going to identify a lot of abnormality because what we know now is that the human genome is not really this ideal uh, string of pearls that we thought about. It's more like Swiss cheese with a lot of holes, a lot of which are called benign CNVs or benign copy number variant that are differences between individuals that may be either completely benign or could play a role in uh, predisposition to diseases or may play a role in uh, 
uh, responses to medications or uh, the, the whole area of pharmacogenomic, or they can cause a severe problem in a particular individual. And by looking at the genome, you are not able to sort these out easily. But in our particular case, really, this is the area we were interested in. And of course, the, the oligoarray did identify this abnormality. But also, it could map it much better than we could do it with the back array. It told us it is exactly 6 megabase uh, a 6 megabase deletion, and as you can see, you could map it almost to the single uh, uh, oligonucleotide. It allows you for very accurate mapping, okay? So the advantages of oligoarrays in clinical diagnosis is that it gives you more coverage of the genome, and in general, it increases your resolution depending on the design of the oligoarray that you have. This is why it's important that you design the array for clinical applications slightly differently than off-the-shelf arrays that you could buy commercially that are available for other applications, mostly research applications. And I will illustrate that with you fairly quickly here. These are three different cases that involve a deletion of the short arm of chromosome 6. This one with the back array is about 855 kilobases. This one is about 722 kilobases. And this one is about 200 KB. And now what we're going to do is take each one of those cases and put them on two different oligo arrays. One which is, has 44,000 oligos and one that has 244,000 and see how we're going to be able to detect this abnormality and if we are able to map it better. So we start with the first one, which is the biggest, and this is the 44,000 feature oligo. Did identify it, it called it abnormal, and this is the 244 ca oligo array. Both of those identified the abnormality, no problem. And you would anticipate that, you would expect this to happen. Now this is another case, uh, the one that has 722 kilobases, and the software here saw something and it was suggestive of the deletion, but it called it normal and the interpretation of the software, whereas this one, it was interpreted as abnormal. So this is only because in order for you to make a call with an oligo array, you need to have more than one oligo indicating that there is an abnormality because by definition the oligo arrays are more noisy so to speak because the target on which you're hybridizing your DNA is small so as a result you have more biological variation and there is more noise you compensate by this by having many oligos into the same area and then by averaging the behavior of these oligos are the four uh, oligos that are contiguous moving all in the same direction yes or no because you generate more data if they are all moving in the right direction and you have more confidence in your results. So there is a complex algorithm that the computer goes through when these features are extracted. So in this case the software uh, flagged it as suggestive but we knew that that was an abnormality and uh, therefore it was called but it was a soft call. Now on the other hand this is the 200 KB which ought to be in, uh, identified by both the, the uh, uh, the oligo arrays, both of them, but both of them were called as normal uh, by the software and it's only when you visualize it that you realize that there is something there but the density of the arrays uh, at that particular locus was not hard enough to have a, 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 a uh, significant result for the software to call it. So the resolution can be dialed by the laboratory, how you design your array and how you pack these oligos. You can dial the resolution up or down for any particular locus by having more oligos at that particular locus. So the problem though is that if you're dealing with a limited number of oligos and you're packing it more in one locus, you are allowing other areas of the genome to have less coverage. So it's a balance between uh, how much data you want to generate and how much data you want to interpret and what are the areas in the genome that are of most clinical importance to you. The other consideration when you do oligoarrays is the question is, if you identify deletions or duplications more importantly, that are smaller than the size of a uh, clone that you can use for, for fish, can you visualize the abnormality, yes or no? And if you cannot, can you use other molecular technologies? So you have to think about this as you're moving forward and developing these arrays. And also, uh, what is the frequency of these uh, copy number variations that you will detect for sure that are 
are of unclear clinical significance, and then how are you going to be able to communicate these results to the clinician? Uh, nobody wants to uh, get a result on about 50% or 100% of the patient they sent to you, but you coming back and telling them, you know, we found a bunch of things in the DNA, we don't know what they mean, here is the report, deal with it. You're not going to have a lot of happy clinicians that way. And also, the other thing you always want to think about is if you check the parents now, since each one of us is uh, a sampling of 50% of my father's DNA, 50% of my mother's DNA, if both my parents are normal and I am not, but we all share the same deletions, then it's more likely that this is a benign polymorphism than not, although there are some caveats with this train, with this, uh, train of thought. Um, We asked the question, as we were developing the oligoarrays uh, for diagnostic applications, we decided to see how they compared with the back arrays that we had. As I showed you earlier, the back arrays have gaps in that they cover areas of the genome, but then there are gaps in between them, whereas the oligoarrays were across the genome. And we thought that with an oligoarray, you're going to have a much better detection rate compared to the, to the back arrays. So we designed a study where we studied about 500 individuals, 460 plus individuals, uh, where we designed an oligoarray that recapitulates the back array that we have, meaning we have one oligo every 10 KB over the footprint of where the backs were. But in between these backs where we had gaps, we put one oligo every 35 KB. And then we asked the question, if we take these patients that are coming, the first 500 consecutive patients, and we run them on the back array because this is what we're doing in our clinical operation, what if we send them to the R&D department, have them run it blind without knowing what the calls were made on the clinical aspect, and see how better or worse they are going to be in our R&D to make these calls based on the new oligo array. So uh, we systematically compared the utility of whole genome back to whole genome oligoarrays. And uh, we ended up studying 466 because we excluded individuals uh, that were sent to us with a known cytogenetic abnormality or, or who had a previous RACGH before. And we excluded all of the prenatal specimens. And here is the punchline here. Um, when you do the whole genome back array, after you uh, identify the abnormalities and exclude those that are benign CNVs, and then after you exclude those individuals where you know that the duplication was inherited from a parent and therefore is most likely normal, you end up with 19.3% detection rate. With the OS, with the oligoarray, <clears throat> if you count if you have five oligos moving in one direction as a hit, then you're going to have every single patient, like I told you, showing you an abnormality. But then you have to sift through this data, and you have to exclude the known CNV, and now you have to run through another algorithm and decide, make a clinical call and say, if you have a deletion or a duplication that is smaller than a certain size, I'm not going to call it. And you can dial this size up and down depending on what you believe in your clinical judgment based on a cohort of patients that you studied and controls, what would be appropriate, yes or no. So you end up with a detection rate based on these studies of 21%. So the detection rate is slightly better, and I will give you an example where these things are better. It is better, the oligoarray is much better in sizing the abnormality. So these are examples here where we identified, for example, a uh, unbalanced translocation between chromosome 4 and chromosome 12, where we have a little 0.5 megabase gap here between the deletion side. And here you have a 16 megabase uh, gain with a 3.5 megabase gap, but when you go ahead and you size it with the oligo array, you can see that you can size it much better. So this gain that we thought was 16.8 and there was a 3.5 megs gap, we know now is 17 megabase gain. This one is refined to 3.7. The other one where it was really important is those individuals where we almost missed it. And this one was missed, it was called as normal because we identified a tiny little blip on the back array. These were two back deletions. We could not confirm them by fish, so when we went and fished to confirm the deletion, the fish was normal. But the uh, oligo array told us this is a 1.3 megabase loss. It's huge. When we tried to understand why we missed it, we realized that here are our back coverage of that area. These are the three backs, two of which are these ones here. 
And then there is a big gap here until we have another three backs in this area. This green bar is the deletion in that patient that was picked up with the oligoarrays. As you can see, these little red dots are the coverage of the oligoarray. So the oligoarray could identify all of this deletion, size it as 1.3 megabase, but the back array only caught the edge of it here. These two backs caught the edge of the deletion, showed this little blip, and the fish was completely normal. So we missed it with the WG, with the, with the back array, but the oligo array allowed us to identify this. So the 2% difference that I told you about were in areas where the deletion happened in the gaps. So in summary, they performed essentially equivalently except for about a 2% detection rate improvement with the oligo compared to the backs. Turnaround time are different and we're working on this. Uh, with the oligo arrays, the recommendation is that you hybridize for two days, so uh, the turnaround time gets longer, but we're working on getting this to become shorter. And I have had conversation today with some uh, people here who said that uh, you could do it probably ch shorter, so we'll, we'll work on this. Uh, but also with the oligo, you identify a lot of areas that are small, that require parental studies, and that require you now to develop a database of known normal abnormalities, so to speak. These are normal copy number variants that should be of clinically no significance so that you don't end up obtaining parents on every patient that you do because that will become very expensive for the healthcare system. So we are working on developing a database and there is a database that already exists, it's known as the Toronto database, that people can go and tap into. Um, and of course oligos are going to uh, detect the sizes better. So whenever you're choosing a platform, if your lab wants to set it up, you want to think about ease of interpretation, uh, how easily is it going to be to identify this copy number alteration and how you're going to interpret them. Uh, what are the clinical uses? Because postnatal is different than prenatal, is different than cancer. Uh, your turnaround times are going to be affected and then the costs of the technology is different. In general, oligoarrays are fairly more expensive. And then uh, there are some technical issues in terms of the availability of fish probes and whether with oligos you can call mosaicism or not. These studies have not been done. Uh, before I conclude, I just want to show you a few examples where, these, uh, where this work has made a real difference in, in uh, patients that otherwise would have never been identified or, or uh, uh, known. Um, about a year and a half ago, we identified a new syndrome. So far, we have identified four syndromes that we published in the medical literature. And uh, this happens to be on a series of four individuals that were sent to us from different laboratories all over the country. And then as we were reviewing our data, we realized that we had four individuals with the same deletion that was never described before, and one individual with a duplication and a triplication of that same area. We ended up calling the various clinicians, and everybody decided to collaborate. And then we discovered this syndrome, we published it, and then it caught the eye of, a, of somebody in the New York Times who asked for permission from the clinicians and the patients to bring the patients together. And they're starting now a small support group for individuals with, hello, 16PP12, you're just like me. So, um, uh, so with this work, you're able to identify new syndromes that until that point that were not known to, to, to exist. Now here are a couple examples only I will show you where making a diagnosis early can make a big difference. So uh, this is a, child, a newborn baby that was born with a lot of dysmorphic features and uh, there were a number of suspicion that this individual clearly has a, has a chromosomal abnormality, uh, that she could have a duplication of the short arm of chromosome 4P based on the facial features, uh, and or it could be a primary neurological problem. So we obtained this uh, case uh, uh, on a Monday and then uh, we ran it by Wednesday we had results and that was a big piece of chromosome 13 that is missing. This would have definitely been uh, 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 found by chromosome analysis and it was found by chromosome analysis two weeks later because the turnaround time is sometimes that long. But the important thing in this case is that this child has a deletion that takes out a gene called the RB gene that causes retinoblastoma which is a tumor of the eye. So uh, this is here, this shows you the uh, 
uh, normal chromosome 13, and this is a chromosome 13 that is deleted, and it's missing the signal for the retinoblastoma gene. And eventually, when the karyotype came back, obviously, this is a clearly abnormal chromosome 13. But the advantage of making a diagnosis early is now you can refer that patient by Friday. That patient was seen by an ophthalmologist who did an ophthalmological exam and said that the exam is completely normal. But because we knew what the abnormality was, it was decided that this individual needs to be followed up closely. And by day 26, she started having tumors in the eye that were treated. And the ophthalmologist tells us that this is the youngest patient with retinoblastoma that she had seen and treated. This is another case that was published uh, on a patient that we had uh, uh, obtained from that particular group. Uh, this, is a, this is a young uh, person. She has had a diagnosis of possible prader willi syndrome, which is a diagnosis that gives you developmental delay obesity, and uh, had uh, no diagnosis really. She was negative for all the tests for prader willi uh, until we did a, a microarray on her, and we identified a deletion on the long arm of chromosome 5, uh, which is a fairly small deletion. It's 1.8 megabases, but it is associated with it, uh, this deletion takes out the adenomatosis polyposis coli, which is the gene that can cause multiple adenomas in the colon that can be transformed into cancerous malignant cells. So based on that diagnosis, she was immediately taken for a colonoscopy, and this identified hundreds of polyps. Uh, and also, by uh, upper endoscopy, she also has many polyps. This disease can be associated with thyroid tumors, and by ultrasound, she indeed had thyroid tumors. So the management of that patient changed completely from just, we don't know what she has, let her come later, to having surgery that is life-saving in this particular case. So, this is an advantage of doing a genotype first diagnosis. So now we're taking the model of seeing a patient and saying, I think the patient has Williams syndrome. Let's do fish for Williams. To saying, I think this patient has a genetic diagnosis. Let's do the whole genome, look at it, and now we can make a diagnosis in the genome and go back, take that information, and look at the patient and see if it fits actually this particular genotype. So this has a lot of advantages, especially in conditions where you can diagnose cancer early and make life-saving uh, procedures. Um, and also it's very helpful because you make appropriate referrals to other specialists. You can provide support for the family. Support groups can happen that way. And the patients have a diagnosis now. They can be enrolled in state and federal services. Uh, but with that, also, there are challenges uh, because the diagnosis may overwhelm the family. They may not be ready for such a diagnosis. And also because a lot of these are new conditions, there is a lag in our medical and scientific knowledge about the implications of a lot of those abnormalities. And there is a lack of resources. So obviously, these are issues that we have to deal with now. But we're optimistic that as we know more about these conditions, we're able to set up the infrastructure so that these individuals can get the appropriate uh, testing. And also there are ethical issues of making diagnosis too early. But we have a choice now. We can choose you staying with the old technology and trying to feel our way around making a diagnosis or take the uh, binders off and then be able to look at the, all, at the whole abnormality and make the appropriate diagnosis. So is this the future of cytogenetics? Uh, at first, I used to say, no, this is not the future. It is this way. But what I would like to tell you is that really the future is this, where we start with microarrays, and then when appropriate, we could use the other older technologies. And this has transformed the way we look at chromosomes. Uh, the question, uh, the, uh, the, is it when? You asked when with that transition? Uh, okay, so the question is when is this high resolution of uh, the array that we do, which really tests for DNA copy number variation, when is it going to be trans, uh, t to, to uh, uh, move into also targeted uh, resequencing? The answer is it should be happening now. Uh, so uh, we, the technology exists. Um, and so one can foresee, for example, if you have a child that has seizures, 
with some dysmorphic features. You can go ahead and run array CGH. If you don't find any abnormality, then you can immediately reflex on sequencing the handful, you know, five to 12 known genes that can cause seizures. Um, the answer is the technology exists, it's just a matter of packaging it together in a way that would be cost effective. Because as you know now, while these are possible, they are fairly expensive technologies. I think the price will be coming down. Once it becomes doable, I, I mean, we should do it. We should be doing it now. That's my answer to that question. Sure. We, um, it, it depends on the abnormality that you identify. So if it's normal, it's normal. Now with the oligo arrays, we are, we started uh, uh, saying that, you know, if you have an abnormality, if it's one of the known abnormalities, again, the interpretation is fairly simple. You know, this is a deletion of three megabase, and we give the uh, 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 sequence coordinates as to where it starts, where it ends, and we say this is associated with Williams syndrome. But in cases where you have not had any case before that was described like that, we usually get the parents and then to see if it's de novo or not. And then in our interpretation, we say, this is the deletion. This is the size of this deletion. We haven't seen it before. There is uh, nothing that we know about in the literature. But sometimes if the size is big, so if it's a two megabase deletion and it's de novo, then it's most likely causative in that particular patient. We are being asked by our clinicians to provide more information, to go and give them some uh, feel about the literature. So we're starting now, we're actually going to hire a genetic counselor to do a lot of this literature search so that when we find abnormalities, we are able to provide a bigger report that provides more information. It's a challenge. Some clinicians now are asking us to list all the genes in the interval. So that will be the next thing that we will be doing. Some clinicians say, I don't want to know all the genes in the interval. So it's hard. It's, it's not easy, but we will be able to provide a mechanism to give all of the known genes in that particular interval. Sometimes you may argue, well, if you have a 15 megabase deletion, you know, there are a few hundred genes that I don't want to know. But it may make sense if you have a child with, let's say, seizures, and they have a 500 KB deletion, and it takes out a sodium channel in the brain. Then you want to know that, because this may be something that's causative. So um, again, uh, we try to provide as much information as possible, but we're being asked to provide more and more, including list of all the genes in the interval. We don't do it yet, but we will be moving in that direction. Yeah, um, it, it, very nice talk. It, it, just thinking, it, so you're compiling a database now of what appear to be neutral copy number variants. In other words, they're not disease causing, but it, it's at least theoretically possible that some combination of, of things that in isolation or, or at least with in combination with some other frequent normal allele don't cause disease, the two of these together might. So have you found any cases like that? And do you think that that's a real issue or just sort of a theoretical construct? The, the question is now that these databases are being developed to identify either benign copy number variant or true copy number variant that cause disease, uh, there are situations where you may have DNA copy number variation whereby a specific combination of these abnormalities can cause a, 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 a phenotype, whereas a different combination will be completely normal. The answer is we're not there yet when it comes to this particular approach. Because the other thing, this is a very good question. It's very complicated to try to get to the bottom of it because some of those deletions, maybe, it be, maybe they are just uncovered a recessive allele. They may be normal. If you, if you think about it, you have a rare point mutation at, that is allelic to where the deletion is. You may have 100 patients, with 100 individuals with that deletion. Maybe 90%, 99% of them are normal. But one individual who happens to have a point mutation on the other non-deleted allele may be devastated. And uh, the, the answer to the question is we're not there yet. We don't have the uh, ability to be able to interpret that more uh, in a more sophisticated way. Yeah. Uh, 
Uh, the question is, if we have any uh, experience with uh, uh, malignant uh, abnormalities, tumors or leukemias, uh, we, are, we do not do that work. Uh, our background, it's maybe one of the things I did not go to school to, to do. Um, so we don't, but we are collaborating and we would be interested in collaborating with people in this institution also to um, uh, develop some uh, diagnostic tests that will be helpful for these malignancies. If you look at the research literature of RAC on RACGH, the majority of it is on cancer. So it's just now a matter of being able to take all these data and be design a test that will have clinical utility that you could use in the clinic. Uh, but we're not involved in that very actively yet.